nearly 400,000 cubic meters of ice and snow, 18,000 men and women, and one monumental task. In just four weeks, turn a Chinese city from winterland into wonderland. The Harbin Ice and Snow Festival. Get an inside look as Harbin's workers build a theme park bigger than Disneyland. And follow some of the world's best ice and snow carvers in a gruelling quest for gold. You're crazy, you know, the weather is so cold. Will the brutal temperatures vanquish Team America's power tools? Or will a team from the tropics steal the show? It's time to party hard with the million visitors to one of the world's hottest winter destinations. China's Ice Vegas. Far northern China, dead of winter, 4 a.m., 15 degrees below zero. Thousands of workers begin another day of manhandling giant chunks of ice. Miserably cold work and downright dangerous. Winter after winter, these work teams risk their lives in the sub-zero dawn. Because every year, one of China's most remarkable events depends on them. It happens here, halfway between the North Pole and the equator, in the city of Harbin. If you live in Harbin, you've got to love winter. For five months of the year, the mercury rarely hovers above zero. Bitterly cold winds chill the air, freeze the river, and turn the city into an urban icebox. Some might call it a frozen purgatory. But the people of Haobin don't see it that way. For them, Arctic temperatures mean it's time to get ready for China's biggest winter party. The Harbin Ice and Snow Festival. Three of the world's most astonishing winter attractions. Jiaolin Park, the home of ice art. Sun Island, home of the Snow Expo. And Ice and Snow World, the biggest winter theme park on the planet. Harbin's Songhua River provides the festival's raw materials. 380,000 cubic meters of ice and snow. And it takes a workforce of 18,000 to put it all together. Every year, this mega festival's a daunting challenge. And lately, nature's been making it even harder. This year, the average temperature is already four degrees higher than normal. Global warming could be this festival's worst nightmare. December 6th. There's not a moment to lose. In less than a month, the festival opens its doors. The river ice is cut into strips over 300 meters long and then split into 500 kilogram ice cubes. <laughs> Leading one team of ice harvesters is Liu Fengjin. I'm responsible for group one of Liu Feng harvesting team. I've been harvesting for the festival for more than 10 years. 
A decade of ice harvesting has taught Mr. Liu that the secret to success is safety. So Mr. Liu takes few chances. He employs the same team year after year. They are all very experienced. Some of them started 20 years ago. They are very skilled. But even skilled workers make mistakes. Zhang Jidong spends his day splitting sheets of floating ice with absolute concentration. I had fallen into the water. That was a really cold day. A band of really thin ice had formed onto the edge. I wasn't paying attention and I stepped on it and I fell through. For these men, there's no escaping the dangers or the cold. It's part of the job description. Lock, 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 lock. This year, Mr. Liu's team must cut and haul a quota of at least 2,000 cubic meters of ice every day. That's over 200 truckloads. Each man earns just one Chinese yuan. That's less than 15 US cents for every meter of ice he harvests. Around here, that's good money. And it's what gets these guys out of bed and back onto the ice every morning. And this winter, they'll have plenty of work. The festival's biggest venue, Ice and Snow World, needs 125,000 tons of ice, enough to fill nearly 50 Olympic-sized swimming pools. Its builders have just over two weeks to transform a 400,000 square meter plot from wasteland to winter wonderland. It's a big job, and the man who's going to make it happen is director of Ice and Snow World, Liu Rei Chung. This year's Ice and Snow World is themed Olympic dreams. Mr. Liu's assignment, create over 50 icy replicas of iconic landmarks from around the world. His design team models each building on a computer to estimate the volume of ice needed to make it and to help the construction teams visualize their task. This year's buildings include London's Westminster Abbey, Athens's Parthenon, and Beijing's Tiananmen Gate. But the most ambitious design won't be like any other. The central tower is our biggest highlight. It is also called the Olympic Tower. It is the tallest building in the ice and snow world. It is 54 meters high. It's made of 12,000 cubic meters of ice. 1,800 people are working on it around the clock. When it's finished, the Olympic Tower will be almost as high as the Leaning Tower of Pisa. But this tower won't tilt. The tower is anchored around a steel skeleton a strong foundation to hold up over 10,000 tons of ice. Ice and Snow World's 12,000 workers have just weeks to turn this empty lot into an ice park bigger than Disneyland. And this year, that's even harder than it sounds. In this warmer than usual winter, the river ice is starting to crack. And if it gets any hotter, the ice and snow will melt, and Harbin City Fathers will have to ponder the unthinkable, cancelling the Ice and Snow Festival for the first time since it began.
downtown Harbin. December 16th. Festival fever is hitting the streets. There's no shortage of festival volunteers here. These people have a passion for ice art. Harbin held its first ice and snow festival in 1985, but its roots run deep. For hundreds of years, the people of northern China used half-frozen buckets of water to shelter lamps from bitterly cold winds. These ice lanterns were like beacons of hope during the long, hard winters. And the inspiration for today's ice masterpieces. At Sun Island Snow Expo, workers are building a record-breaking snow sculpture. When it's finished, it will be the length of two soccer fields. Nearly 12 stories high, the largest snow sculpture in the world. Building the entire expo will take over 120,000 cubic meters of snow. But designer Zhang Ningge won't get that much snow from the sky. The artificial snow is very clean and safe. We use the water from the Songhua River. This snow is pure and clean, like white jade. To feed the snow machines, Mr. Zhang's team pumps over a million liters of water from the river every day. And the machines turn it into 5,000 cubic meters of snow. Workers pack the snow into huge wooden crates, then compact it and freeze it into solid blocks. Now comes the tricky part. You can't build a 35-meter-high snow building from the ground up. You have to start from the top and carve down. Tough enough in any year, but this year, even tougher, thanks to rising temperatures. At minus 15, a snow machine can make 60 cubic meters of snow per hour. But today, it's only minus five, and the machines are barely working. The cold weather came pretty late. Minus 15 is very good for sculpting, but minus 5 will affect the sculpture. There's bad news for all the harvesters. Heavy water flow from upstream is lifting the ice, causing crevices. Cracked ice isn't strong enough for construction and the brittle surface makes the harvest even more difficult and dangerous. At Sun Island, overheated snow is causing trouble. Traffic's been diverted from a replica of Paris's Arc de Triomphe, softened by the sun and in need of emergency repairs. And designer Zhang Ningge is struggling to save his 200-meter-long snow sculpture. We have a warm winter this year. The top part of the sculpture has started to cave in under the warm south wind. So what do we do? We polish it up and mend it with new snow. Fortunately, the organizers have a plan to keep the heat off their ice and snow. They have installed huge sunshades to protect the sculptures. Identical shades also shelter the epic constructions at Ice and Snow World. 
But director Liu isn't worried about the weather. At the construction phase, the warm weather is a big advantage. Because it's warm, the builders can walk even without gloves, and they work faster and better. This temperature is also good for opening because it's more comfortable for visitors. If it gets too cold, not many visitors will come. Despite the rising temperatures, Mr. Liu is upbeat about finishing in record time. The construction is going very fast. We estimate it; it will finish a day faster than last year. I am very satisfied. December seventeenth, final days of the ice harvest. Liu Fengjin is about to make his last delivery to Ice and Snow World. But before he can unload, he's got to pass quality control. On a good year, the ice can be as thick as 50 centimeters. But in this warmer year, festival organizers are buying ice as thin as 30 centimeters. Mr. Liu's ice is thick enough, but it's not all crystal clear. Inspectors are looking for clear ice that will shine more brightly under light. If his ice is rejected, Mr. Liu will be leaving empty-handed. Each truckload is about eight to nine cubic meters. It's worth 200 yuan or so. Liu's ice passes the test. All the hours of hazardous work in freezing darkness have paid off. Down at the base of the Olympic Tower, the workers are installing lights. Over 100,000 weather-resistant fluorescent tubes will light up the park at night. Laid end on end, the lights would be over 100 kilometers long. Thousands will soon flock to this spectacle, like moths to a flame, and some VIPs are already arriving. At the airport, ice and snow carving competition organizer Catherine Wong is waiting for some of the nearly 100 elite ice and snow artists flying into Harbin from around the world. Tonight, Catherine's here to meet one of this year's main contenders. Uh, yeah, Catherine. So, are uh, you asking? Yes. Uh huh. Nice to meet you. Uh, nice to meet you. And Aaron? This is Charlie. I'm Aaron. Oh, yeah, Charlie. This is Charlie. Okay, Charlie. My wife's there. Aaron Kostic okay. and his partner, Charlie Neff, are highly favored. But it's the first time they've okay. competed in Harbin. <laughs> Team America isn't sure what to expect. So they've packed for any conditions. I, I, I bought $300 worth of underwear, <laughs> and I'm ready to go to the moon. <laughs> but can even these super carvers handle Harbin? Winter carving is a grueling event. It takes a special breed of artist to work outdoors in a Harbin winter for three days. Teams of up to two artists wrestle a two-ton block of ice into shape using electric and hand tools. This is not a contest for the faint-hearted. And that's exactly why the world's top ice and snow carvers want to be here. Thirty-four teams with members from 11 different countries will compete this year. At the kickoff meeting, it's all smiles and handshakes. 
But make no mistake, none of these teams has flown thousands of kilometers to come in second. Competition organizer Catherine Wong introduces the judges and explains the rules of engagement. Officials randomly assign each team a block of ice. The quality of the block and its position in the arena are critical. If a block has too many cracks, or if it sits in the sun all day, it could weaken the ice, and that could cost a medal. A very cold war is about to begin. It's time to check the weapons. Team USA knows its gear intimately, because Aaron and Charlie designed and built a lot of it themselves. We call it a bullet burr, and it has tungsten carbide teeth, and it spins at 33,000 RPM, and it turns ice into snow very quickly. It's a fantastic tool. I really, uh, as soon as I put the chainsaw down, the first tool that I reach for is that one. But not all their tools are what you'd expect. We use the iron to freeze ice together. And the way we do that is we use the iron to heat up the aluminum. The hot aluminum then, we put the ice on it, move it around, get it nice and flat, and then we put the two pieces of ice together and they freeze together nicely. I really like this chisel, and the reason is because it's got a lot of craftsmanship in it, and what we call in the ice sculpting world, mojo. These guys could lose all their mojo if their American 110 volt power tools don't convert to the Chinese 220 volt system. If there's any problem, turning on this large 10 amp chainsaw will reveal it. All right, see, see what happens. Yeah. Ready? Mm -hmm. The noise isn't good news for their neighbors, but it's music to Aaron's ears. I see it always being a, a, a goal that with a number of steps we can accomplish it and enjoy, enjoy ourselves out there. And I don't see any, any of the hurdles, potential hurdles being too big for us to, you know, to get over. At Ice and Snow World, another group of master carvers focus on their job. Over 100 saws cut the ice down to size. Three cranes and 50 gantries help haul the blocks into place, and workers cement them together, not with concrete, but with water. When water freezes, it glues the ice together. The winter weather helps to bind the ice bricks but it also makes working conditions miserable for its builders, like Wang Jin. The cold is the greatest difficulty. Hands and feet are freezing. Water freezes up right away when it's in open air. But I still sweat. See? Zhao Lin Park, 9 a.m. Day one of the Harbin International Ice Carving Contest. Teams get a two-ton block of ice, a power supply, and less than 72 hours to create a masterpiece. It's a beautiful block. Structurally, we don't see any cracks in it. it. Came out of a river, it's hard to believe. In ice carving, there's more than one way to sculpt a block. Some draw their designs straight onto the ice. Some use a paper stencil and some just power up and go for it. Team USA is leaving no detail to chance. We're going to take chunks off that we're going to use later, set them off to the side, and uh, just kind of go, that'll be our morning today. It's a meticulous plan, but it doesn't give anything away. So it's difficult to imagine that this block will soon be carved into three manta rays swimming around a coral tree. Like Aaron and Charlie, most of this year's ice carving teams are no strangers to cold. They hail from countries like Russia, Canada, and Japan. And then there's Team Malaysia. Mustafa Kamal bin Otman and John Yong 
are professional ice carvers from sweltering Kuala Lumpur. Yeah, they say you're crazy, you know, the weather is so cold and you have to wear so many clothing, you know. The first time you have to wear a lot of, a lot of clothing. Even the, our pants, you know, you have to wear three inside. So warm and, you know, you get rashes inside. You know? Now we're really used to it, yes. But some competitors may never get used to the cold. At the Harbin International Snow Carving Contest on Sun Island, Arun Kumar Chatterjee is this competition's version of the Jamaican bobsled team. It's the third time this artist from Delhi, India, has competed in snow sculpture, but it never gets any easier. He's a new things for me. He's do these things in my country. He can't do these things in snow festivals. Carving snows a world apart from carving ice. No chainsaws here. Teams can only use hand tools. And they're carving gigantic nine cubic meter blocks of snow. For Patricia Le Guen from Canada, it's all about getting your head around the height. It's a little uh, challenging at first when you stand in front of a 12-foot block, and then we're raising it a couple more feet, so it's going to be 14 feet tall. It's impressive, but it, once you get going, you forget about the height. Patricia's been to Harbin four times. This year, she's chosen a tough assignment. From, Up to here? From the front of the face. Yeah, from the front. Portraying Saskatchewan pioneer leader, Gabriel Demont. I need to be able to stand to do this part and the, the eyes too. But she's not the only one to bring a little bit of home to Harbin. Arun has teamed up with a couple of Canadian sculptors to carve an Indian god. He's like a Ganesh. He's one type of animal in my country, is elephant. He's elephant, he's my country, he's like a god. On the first day of the competition, the teams shovel out as much of the rock-hard snow as they can. Broken equipment will cost some competitors valuable time. But they can fix hand tools faster than power tools. At the ice carving competition, the artists are about to find out how fast they can work without power. The top cut is already done. It just keeps coming and going. The 110 volt electricity supplied by the organizers isn't giving Aaron and Charlie the power they need. Uh, eventually we can switch to hand tools, but at this point, it's impossible to make this cut with a hand tool. You know, it's just not something you can do. It's something you have to use a chainsaw for. Uh, 220, right? They uh, have 220. Just a moment, just a moment. After 17 ice and snow festivals, Catherine Wong's seen it all and solved it all. Because we have these types of problems every year, these problems will eventually be solved. I'm not worried at all. Same on the other side, there's another crack on the other side. Catherine doesn't have to wait long for the next crisis. Team Germany isn't happy with its block. We were having some issues with this, the cracks. We're doing a uh, figure that has long arms symbolizing life. It's the Chinese symbol for life and there are humans intertwined through it. And these cracks that come right through it come right through critical areas. Catherine's got back up an emergency stash of extra ice blocks. If you want to change, you can change to the ice block 33. 
Meanwhile, Aaron and Charlie have switched from their American 110 volt system to the local 220 volt power supply, thanks to a spare adapter from a shaving kit. It's running a big 10 amp saw successfully. Problem solved. But now the power hungry gearheads have to play catch up with the rest of the field. They'll need to work even faster to cut their block into 25 different pieces and then reassemble those parts into three manta rays. This is where that iron comes in handy. The hot aluminium melts the surface of the ice and then the blocks snap freeze together. One part, two parts, three, four, five, six, seven pieces of ice all fused together. 3 p.m. As the sun sets, most of the carvers are happy with their progress. To reach to our target. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So we, we continue tomorrow? Yeah, I only have one speed, off or on. So on, uh, on gets a lot of stuff done and off doesn't. Nice, uh, but tonight, Team Germany's in for the long haul. Who needs dinner? You know, what is dinner? Who needs food? Whatever they eat, it'll be a cold supper. It's good, maybe you get us a little doggy bag. Yeah. Somebody asked him. On a winter's night, Harbin's temperature can drop to below minus 30 degrees. Despite all its problems, day one of the competition's been a success. But who knows what new problems day two will bring. Ice and snow world. 48 hours till opening night. The temperatures dropped just in time to remove the protective shades and scaffolding, revealing the work of the festival's crack team of carvers. Twelve thousand workers have cut, lifted, and shaped over 200,000 cubic meters of ice and snow, turning winter into wonder. Westminster Abbey, built with more than 3,000 cubic meters of ice. And there's the Parthenon Temple, six stories high, looking over the park. and Tiananmen Gate, 50 meters long, 15 meters high. But the real ice megastructure is the Olympic Tower, 54 meters tall, made from almost 1,500 truckloads of ice. Day two, ice carving contest. 30 hours left on the clock. But for one team, the competition's already over. Team Havarovsk of Russia knocked out of the contest when its sculpture suddenly collapsed overnight. I had done the sculpture once at home and it was fine, but maybe here the ice was not strong enough. I'm too sad. It's a pity, but I'm sad. It shouldn't happen this way, but fortunately, no one was hurt. The disaster has forced other teams to rethink their designs. John and Mustafa are worried their top-heavy Malaysian mask might not last the distance. <coughs> Due to the weather, so warm, and uh, I think it's not suitable for us to cut the base 
to balance up the, this figure. Their sculpture was going to balance on top of a thin neck, but now they're not going to take the risk. Team USA's block is holding firm, and so's their confidence. It's a competition, so you're supposed to show them, do the best you possibly can do. I think a lot of people try to do too much new stuff, and uh, they should do that in practice, I think. Last night, the weather may have been warm enough to weaken ice sculptures, but today, it's bitterly cold, well below minus 20 degrees. At the snow carving, India's Arun Kumar Chatterjee definitely isn't dressed for this kind of weather. So his superhuman stamina in the cold has his teammates puzzled. He's just wearing uh, almost some penny loafers. He said his feet are, are fine. Mine are almost a little chilled, and I'm wearing uh, minus, rated minus 40 boots, so maybe he's got warm blood. But even in weather like this, there's more than one way to keep warm. An indoor area has been set up for shivering competitors to escape the chill. And in here, Arun's discovered his secret cure for the cold. I put in the vodka with coffee, and it's very nice. And he's now he's feeling very good for me. It's very hot. Whether it's the special brew or a few minutes of warmth, Arun will go back to work a much happier artist. There's less than a day left until both the ice and snow competitions draw to a close. It's time for the finishing touches. Attention to detail will make the difference between failure and success. For carvers and for festival organizers. Ice and Snow World. 24 hours before opening. Director Leo isn't taking any chances that his Olympic tower won't be ready to dazzle on cue. He wants a sneak preview of it all lit up and orders a lighting test. A flick of the switch removes all doubt that the Olympic Tower is a masterpiece. This is the best lighting I've seen for all these nine years. I'm overwhelmed. It is a miracle to have lights like this under an ice building. Tomorrow night, Mr. Liu gets to share the miracle with the rest of the world. But today, all eyes are on the competition. Only five hours left in the ice and snow carving contests. Everyone's racing the clock. For Team USA, the pressures never let up. In fact, it's reaching peak intensity. Aaron and Charlie are getting ready for the final step, assembling their sculpture. One false move and dreams of victory will come crashing down. I'm not real happy with my position. Mm -hmm. And as if this weren't nerve-wracking enough, the judges drop by to watch. This spot seems to have a first prize from Trey. Maybe it's good feng shui or maybe it's supreme concentration. But Aaron and Charlie pull it off. Good. But it was a uh, pretty harrowing experience. I like it. I kind of wish it was out that way further. Maybe 10 inches or so, but 
But there's no time for deliberation. Team USA will need to keep working up to the last minute just to get finished in time. At the snow carving, Patricia is polishing the face of Gabriel Demont. We could spend a week doing this, you know. That's why they time us and uh, give us a set amount of time to do it, because, I mean, you could just keep carving, but you have to know when to stop. Arun Kumar Chatterjee offers Ganesh a final prayer before leaving him to the elements. Arun won't miss the cold, but that doesn't mean he won't miss China. Actually, I miss in China for his, his Chinese food. And he is like in, in Chinese vodka. I miss every time in Chinese vodka and Chinese food. And it's very delicious for me. Time's up at the snow carving contest. The judges move in to decide who will win and who will lose. For the ice carvers, time's almost up. Aaron and Charlie are applying some last minute finishing touches. What do you think, Charlie? It's, it, I'm in love, yeah, it's great. <laughs> it's even better than I thought. The two Americans can finally take a moment to savor their work and remember why they love carving ice. To make this out of stone or wood or bronze would take a, a week or a month or a lifetime. And here we just did it in three days. Team Malaysia's also done. Their top heavy feathered ice mask was a challenging feat of engineering. When it threatened to topple, John and Mustafa decided not to risk any more carving. They're happy with their work and happy they came. Most of the sculptures are very nice. Every year they are, they are improving, you know. Every year we see different tools. So from there we, we learn something from other countries with winters. Team Germany is also happy. By working through their first night, they have overcome the setbacks of day one and finished on time. It was a huge block. The other block would never have worked. This was really solid where we needed it to be solid. It's just so I'm very happy with it. She's not terribly happy with it. But, but I never uh, am. That's nothing unnormal. It's very usual. I never am. Typical think, artist. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be a tough call for Zhu Chaodong and his panel of judges. <laughs> I think there are many excellent works this year. They are each unique in their artistic styles. Impressionist, realistic, and demonstrating a multitude of skills. Nice compliment, but Judge Ju isn't giving anything away. It is hard to say what the result is. We'll see later. <laughs> Ice and Snow World is getting a last-minute touch-up before it opens its doors to thousands of people from all around the world. In only a few hours, this year's Harbin Ice and Snow Festival will be rolling out the red carpet, and every last detail's got to be right, because it's nearly party time. 31 teams of the 22nd China Harbin International Ice Sculpture Competition After three days of fighting the cold the and racing the clock, the elite carvers are about to find out who's going home with gold. And the winners are... In snow carving, gold to Russia. Patricia must settle for bronze. Arun Kumar Chatterjee, commemorative medal. And in ice carving, Team Germany, commemorative medal. 
Team Malaysia, the jury's special prize for skill. A tie for silver between Russia and Mongolia. And the gold goes to... The first prize goes to Team 2 of America. Aaron and Charlie's moment of triumph is also Harbin's. But the festival's work is far from over. It's opening night for the public. Tens of thousands of people are descending on Harbin's biggest winter attraction, Ice and Snow World. The temperature is minus 19 degrees. But even this mega chill won't keep people at home tonight. I declare Ice and Snow World officially open. Every year, millions of people are dazzled by China's very own Ice Vegas. There are a lot of ice and snow festivals in the world, but uh, this place is number one and number two is not even close. Now the real party begins. Not a moment too soon. On a night this cold, you've got to keep moving. As the celebration takes off, Olympic tower builder Wang Jin shows his grandkids what their granddad built. Then we pour water on it, it freezes right away. We then use a chisel to shape it. When I was working here, it was so cold and hot. But I'm looking at the result now. It is better than ever before. Ice and snow world is getting better every year. That makes us workers want to come back to work here. <laughs> Even the boss is happy, although Director Liu thinks there's still room for improvement. Next year is the 10th Ice and Snow World. According to Chinese tradition, we should do a small celebration every five years and a big celebration every 10 years. We are determined to make an even better park. But not everybody's partying. Team USA is back at the ice carving arena for one last look. Winning gold is great, but this memory will be the biggest prize they'll be taking home. I think that just the appreciation and the experience are our reward. Aaron and Charlie will soon return to the United States, but their sculpture will stand tall for another two months. As long as winter brings freezing cold temperatures to the far north, the people of Harbin will dance, sing, and celebrate their good fortune. When spring finally thaws this wonderland of ice and snow, millions of liters of water will drain back into the Songhua River. And Harbin will start planning and eagerly awaiting an even bigger and better Ice and Snow Festival. <laughs>